You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. There was a lot of physical abuse that went on in the second school. Uh, when I say physical abuse, I'm on about um, uh, uh, beatings, well, like full-on beatings. I'm talking carers um, jumping in with some of the bigger kids um, running in your room at a fucking 11, 12 midnight um, with football boots and pillowcases. The last boarding school was, was the worst um, and it was only up until recently that um, I found out that at least on, on one occasion um, that I was sexually abused in that school. I did a video for her because they couldn't identify one of the carers. One of them was called Mr. Johnson. Couldn't identify him, couldn't find him. So I did a video uh, saying um, about what he did. And I was talking to him on this video. And uh, I mentioned in the video, the thing is, life's a bitch. Because out of all of them kids that you were fucking abusing at that time, you, you had no idea that one of them kids was gonna be this superstar in, in social, in this thing that we call social media. It doesn't even fucking exist yet. And he ended up being a fan of mine, believe it or not. I can very easily go on that self-destructive mode, 100%. And there's things, I've had fantasies about it, um, hurting people, destroying people that have hurt me. Now apparently it was an unreleased fucking copy of the book and bookies were taking bets on who fucking died. So apparently it was worth a shitload of money. I've never I've never read a book in my life until <laughs> this fucking point. <laughs> so I never fucking watched yeah. Harry Potter, so I knew fuck all about it. But what I did have um, was I had tools and I had a gun. I started doing videos on training, this is how it started. All of a sudden, um, I started having a bit of a fucking um, following. It went up to something like 60,000 just on training. People were loving it, people were coming down, they were um, paying for PTs, they were driving all the way from Manchester, and I'd be in the fucking cupboard crying. My brother would be like, listen, I don't want to hear your shit, go and train. I stayed in, in the gym one night, and I filled a syringe up with, with insulin, and um, I cried that much that I fell asleep with it in my hand and I woke up the next morning. I had 260,000 followers at that point. Um, and he said, yeah, no problem. I did it and we put them up for sale and we did 17 and a half grand in one hour. That was the moment then everything changed. Boom, we're on. And today's we're on. guest, we've got Aaron Lambo. How are you, brother? I'm all right, mate, yeah. This has been over a year in the making, trying to get you on here. I know, I've tried to be a bit of a diva, but it, it didn't work in the end, did it? Nah. Got me. Good to have you here, mate. Thank you. And uh, this is uh, the first time that I've ever done um, an outsider's interview. I'm honoured. Actually. So um, you fucking should be. Yeah, I'm uh. <laughs> So you lead a very interesting life. A man who's criminal background, bodybuilder. And now you're running a multi-million dollar, million, multi, multi-million pound business. Mm -hmm. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. For making some changes, putting some positivity back in the world. I know you do a lot of videos, motivation. Now you're all over the world and you're running businesses everywhere. And for people who are watching, it doesn't matter your past, it doesn't matter your how fucked up you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, you can make changes. It's true. It is true. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm proof of it. <laughs> so I always go back to the start with my guests. Okay. Where you grew up and how it all began? Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it, I suppose this interview depends on what you know and what you watch. Um, Everything. A lot of people, um, you know, they, they don't know a lot because they, they only watch what they choose to see. Um, you're on social media, I'm sure you you know that. And like, like we just had a, a conversation pre before the interview, people think it's easy doing what we do because of what they see. They only see what we want them to see online. And it's... Uh, a totally different story even when I'm putting my personal things on online either from my past or my criminal past um, growing up again it's only um, parts that I've I've chosen to put up you know it's not all of it so and you know it is what it is but um, I suppose no different to, to most um, I was born on a council estate um, grew up uh, went to um, uh, some some schools, got kicked out of schools, um, but the majority of my upbringing though, um, which made it a little bit different, a little bit difficult, was um, getting put into care for, for a period of, of my life. So How old were you? When I went to care, I was 11 years old. So yeah, 
Did you become rebellious then when that happened? Yeah, it was pretty fucked up, actually. Um, my start was, I was very sick, believe it or not. I was that um, uh, kid that um, uh, suffered with breathing. So I had severe asthma. Um, I still suffer with asthma now, but when I say severe, I, there, I, I had to have a, an oxygen um, machine um, attached to me all the time. So there, I, I couldn't go anywhere without it. So the, during uh, my time in primary school, I was that kid that had to sit in while everybody else was out, um, you know, in the playground playing. I was never allowed to go out. I was never allowed to do sports. I was never allowed to do PE, never allowed to do swimming. There was a couple of occasions um, that I was actually um, uh, brought back by paramedics. Um, after having some severe asthma attacks at home. Um, there was a time um, that I actually uh, lived a very short period in hospital, um, in Peterborough General Hospital on the children's ward. So it was, uh, it was a serious um, condition, and I suppose it affected me, um, even though I didn't realise it at the time. Plus, this will make you laugh, I stunk a piss. I mean, I wet the bed up until I was about fucking 16. Um, so I, I was that, anyway, mate. I was that kid on a breathing apparatus that stunk a piss, basically. I was that one. Yeah. Do you get bullied? Um, not so much then. Um, bullying, not really, because I always used to fight back. So I can't say I was a, yeah. a victim, victim. Did um, you feel like an outcast, though? Not able to play sports, not able to go out and mingle with other kids? No, I felt confused. Actually, um, I have, um, and what I'm telling you now actually is is, is what I, I speak to my therapist about. I mean, I have a very good ther therapist, um, Ellen McChrystal, and I've been through fucking loads over the years. Um, but this one I found and, and I have weekly sessions with her um, and she's saved me. And in my opinion, she saved um, other people. Um, and I'll tell you the same as I told her, I, I felt confused. I mean, my mum broke up from uh, my dad when I was a baby and uh, she was adamant that, sh that he was going to have nothing to do with me. So I grew up um, not knowing who my dad was. Um, because of that, um, I didn't know who some of my brothers were, which was a weird one. So, um, so I've got three brothers and three sisters. So what I ended up, um, we've got different mums and different dads. So the lad that I used to think was my best friend playing with me every day, Calvin, was actually my brother. And I found out one day when uh, I had an altercation on the, on, on, on the council estate where I was living. Um, some lad tried to uh, nick my bike. Calvin come running out and, and he had the kid up against, uh, against the wall by his throat and he said, you touch my brother again, I'll hit you. And I'm like, fucking, what do you mean, brother? Shortly after that, I then found out um, who my dad was. But the weird thing is, my mum never, my, my, my never stopped my relationship with my grandmother and my grandmother is my dad's mum. Uh, my grandmother is, um, uh, she, she, she's my world. She's always had, had a massive influence on my life. She's the one that's never lied to me in my life. So my mum would allow me to stay with my grandmother in London. So I would go to number one point and road Tottenham where she lived. But then my grandmother wouldn't stop her son from coming to see me. But at the same time, she knew that if my mum found out that my dad was coming to see me, then she would stop me from seeing my grandmother. So my dad would come around to see me and I was told that that was my Uncle Ian. So <laughs> welcome to the world, it's Aaron. Fucking so, my best, right. <laughs> so my best friend is my fucking brother. My Uncle Ian is my dad. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a bit weird, you know, my yeah. Uncle Ian grabbing me, cuddling me, giving me loads of kisses all the time, taking me to fucking mm -hmm. pizza. I'm thinking oh, I've got a fucking great uncle here. And that was my what dad. What age did you find out? Who was your dad? Uh, 11 or 12. How was your relationship with him? With him? Um... I remember um, the day that I, I found out that he was my dad. Um, it was somebody from Child Social Services um, had, had spoke to me in the headmaster's um, office of the primary school at the time. This was before I got sent away to care, probably about a month before, saying, do you know who your dad is? And I said, no. And they said, if it could be anybody in the world, who would it be? And you know what, coincidentally, I said, Uncle Ian. I said that because... I remember him taking me to pizza. I just mm. remember him being this big, strong um, guy. He was a doorman. He was an entrepreneur. He was a businessman. He was a ladies' man. He was fucking everything. Um, and I actually genuinely said, Uncle Ian. And that's when they said, your Uncle Ian is your, is your dad, um, which was a strange one. But then from the moment they said that, um, then my opinion um, and my view of Uncle Ian and my dad changed because the moment he was then introduced to my life my mum used him as a weapon 
I would only go and see him when I needed disciplining, you know? So, uh, and he, he, he realised that very quickly. And when he realised that very quickly and he told her that isn't going to happen, that was when I was sent to care, yeah. How was it in care? Because did you not try to set someone on fire in care? How the fuck do you know about that? I know everything. I'm the best in the game, mate. <laughs> I'm the best the in the game. You I heard someone that? you threw like paper over them and tr- I set a bin in fire with paper in it and threw it over them. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that was. And I shouldn't be laughing about it. I'm laughing at the fact that you know about that. Um, yeah, yeah. My uh, my behaviour changed rapidly. I was a very sick child, which was the reason why I went into care. Um, they had nurses, um, doctors, you know, that were qualified to deal with, with me in the first schools that I went into, you've got to understand we were very, very sick children. You know, you had some kids that had, um, constant needles in their hearts for reasons and, and, and so on and so forth. First day into care, I remember walking in the corridor, had an argument with a kid. He walked up the stairs and he had a fucking Snickers bar, he had an allergy to nuts, choked, <laughs> fell down instantly, died, broke his neck in front of me. What? True story. No. Yeah. I remember when the um, carers come round, me standing next to this kid, twitching on the floor, and I'm like, <laughs> hang what it looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, that was literally like so the So you've seen someone dying? Day, yeah. So that's trauma as well, pain? Yeah, but, well, I suppose you could say that, but I was fucking young, you know, I remember it. Yeah. I remember the stairs, I could describe um, certain things, but as far as that incident staying with me, not really. But then my behaviour started to deteriorate because once we got kicked, that, that school actually closed down. And then I went to another boarding school, which was for sick children and badly behaved children. So now I'm mixing with kids with problems, you know, serious problems. Mental and health. then my, my, um, my um, anger started to come out. Um, and then in that second boarding school, that's when the child abuse started. Um, and then the third boarding school was just all and out um, bad boys boarding school. And then that's when the serious um, uh, abuse started. But the the one you're on about was in was in the the last the last school. Yeah, um, I was. There was a, a lad um, called Leon. Um, uh, from London, there was a lot of kids from London actually, and I was made to share a bed with him. He just took a dislike to me. Big lad, fat lad, used his way against me, and he would just say things to embarrass you, say things to antagonise you. But you know, always when people were around laughing, and I just felt awkward when we were in the room together. It was quiet, and he was just smug, and I just felt awkward. I felt powerless because he was bigger than me. I was a very small lad in height and in stature. Um. And he said, I remember what he said, because uh, my sister at the time was pregnant, and he, I remember what he said, he laughed, and he went, because I put a picture up of my sister on my on my um, bedside table. And he looked, and he went, that your sister, yeah? I went, yeah. And he went, oh, it looks like she's pregnant with my baby. And I don't know what it was, um, but I went quiet. I don't, think, I don't even remember speaking to him the rest of the evening. And I went away for, for him to go to sleep, and uh, I put a, a cheese and onion... Um, empty packet of cheese and onion crisps over the um, the fire alarm and I filled a bin full of paper and I lit it and I threw it on his fucking bed but then uh, yeah the, the bed was highly flammable just went, <laughs> 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 very quickly uh, um, but I don't feel sorry for it it was a cunt yeah, you're very protective um, yeah I would say so is that because of everything that you've went through though um well, you see a lot of things um, happened after that, you know, um, there's been a lot of times, especially going, growing up in, in school, in care, in boarding school, um, you've got nobody uh, to protect you, you know, um, things happen. Uh, and I suppose the few people that have offered me that protection in some way or another, either after that or, um, or very few people from around that time, I'm, uh, I'm very overprotective about. Yeah, and I think rightly so, because it is a scary world out there. But especially all the stuff you went through from being through the system for a very young age, trying mm. to understand. And it's rejection, it's neglect, it's so many different things that people want. Why do they not want me? Were you questioning yourself? Was it you or was it because they couldn't stay up, up to the plate and take care of your, your, their son, basically? Like I, your dad, I, I was always like told that. it was me. Always. Getting I the blame always, all the time. Yeah, always. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't an angel. I was a little fucker. Um, but I, um, 
when I when I look back on it now, um, I and especially with with what's happened recently, you know, in in the courts because I, I we, we we just won a court case against one of the schools, and learning what actually went on and and reading some of the kids' statements that were talking about me, about things I couldn't even fucking remember. Um, it's all of a sudden uh, you, it puts a lot of things into perspective in your head and you and you realize why you are the way you are having said that um i do believe that over uh, uh, during my life i've still been responsible for making the decisions that i've made and i do not believe that any of what happened to me before um should be um used as an excuse for them decisions that, that that I made, I was still competent. I was still, I still had a choice. Um, so I don't believe that you can blame the past for what you're currently doing or what you're going to do in the future. Um, but you can certainly understand why you are, I suppose, the way that you, you are. are. Yeah. But you can also ha- learn to have an element of control over that. Of course, but the brain's a powerful thing. The brain only repeats what it knows and. You become a product of your environment. If you're in the system, if your people are getting bullied and abused, that becomes the norm where you think it is normal. So if you're going through that abuse for 10, 20, 30 years, how long it is, then you, you, you learn to accept it and the brain only repeats. So the 60,000 thoughts we get today will repeat into tomorrow. So it's to break that and you, for you to take responsibility and, and not make blame for your past. But your past is your past. It makes you who you are. It can be difficult, especially if you can through a life of torment and torture and not quite understanding. Now, I see your videos and it's all motivational, all positive about changing and try to put a bit of goodness back into the world. When people get a better understanding, actually, shit, you've went through, man, you're going to get a hell of a lot more respect. So I take my heart off to you, brother, for being so honest. And Thank you. It takes courage and that shows you your character and that shows you how far you've come and how far you're going to go. So when you started going through the system, 14, 15, 16, what was those ages like for yourself? Uh, the the system um, was was hard. In the end, um, I ended up getting uh, kicked out of school at the age of uh, 14. So um, there was a lot of physical abuse that went on in the second school. Uh, when I say physical abuse, I'm on about... Um, uh, uh, beatings, well, like full-on beatings. I'm talking carers um, jumping in with some of the bigger kids, um, running in your room at, at fucking eleven, twelve midnight um, with football boots and pillowcases, um, and 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 hitting you. Um, there's there was the the last boarding school was was the worst, um, and it was only up until recently that um, I found out that at least on on one occasion um, that I was sexually abused in that school. Um, now, when they contacted um, uh, me because they had a lot of other kids that were, were, were abused at school, I just told them about the physical abuse that, that I remembered. Um, but that was that was probably the most traumatic fucking school. That was um, yeah, that was that was that was proper fucked up. That was um, uh, carers. You used to have points, a point system at school. And if you didn't get a certain amount of points, then you wouldn't get a certain amount of privileges after school. So to get your points up, um, some of the carers would make you, would make me jump out of the first floor window repeatedly and then go and do it again and go and do it again and go and do it again until you cry because your leg hurts. But then you can't complain about it or do anything because you'll lose more points. Um, one carer put my head in the, um, uh, the, the school minivan you know, and and even the the lawyer who deals with all of this child abuse, she even broke down and cried in front of me because she realised some of the things that I said in my statement. She said, "Oh my God, that was you." And I was like, "What do you mean?" She said, "All of these kids' statements were talking about a, a, a kid that was getting beaten, and that was you." And I was like, "Really?" And then I read their statements. And, yeah, I remember that van. I remember this. I remember that. I got to the point I even drew a diagram and showed her where certain things happened within the school because they've they've knocked the school down now. Um, and then uh, she, I did a video for her because they couldn't identify one of the carers. One of them was called Mr. Johnson. Now, this is some shit right here. First bodybuilder I ever laid eyes on. Imagine that. A uh, big black guy looked like Mr. T. Had a real fucking long um, fingernail. Couldn't identify him, couldn't find him. So I did a video uh, saying um, about what he did. And I was talking to him on this video. And uh, I mentioned in the video, the thing is, 
life's a bitch because out of all of them kids that you were fucking abusing at that time, you, you had no idea that one of them kids was going to be this superstar in, in social, in this thing that we call social media. It doesn't even fucking exist yet. And he ended up being a fan of mine, believe it or not. He was following you? Yeah. <laughs> My name when I was at school was Aaron Watson. Of course, I'm Aaron Lambo on the internet. Mm-hmm. I've got a fucking tattoo on my face. I'm a bodybuilder. There's no way he was going to... Yeah, he ended up following me. No way. Yeah. So the guy who was abusing you was following oh, you? Oh, it gets better than that. He tried suing me for the video. We got a, we got a, a court claim uh, from his uh, letters from his solicitor. Um, but then that had a, uh, a backlash on him because we found out um, who he was. And because of that video, 22 other kids managed to get um, convictions. Mm-hmm. So... So they're helping put a bit of closure at the kids' house as well? Just through yeah, because they, put us, they put us in a syndicate. Mm-hmm. So the way it worked was the last uh, contact I had with the lawyer, she sat down with me, she said, I've got to tell you something. And I said, what's that? And she said, um, at least one occasion you were sexually abused. I said, how can you say that? I said, I'm telling you I don't remember any of that. She said, you were on um, uh, a nebulizer for your asthma, you were on inhalers for your asthma, you were on nasal spray for, um, for wetting the bed. Uh, we've got your records because she was getting them because they knocked the school down, getting them in parts. She said, uh, none of your medical records in the school were you ever um, prescribed tablets at night. And you said that this particular person used to come in and give you tablets along with your medication. I said, yeah. She said, the other children that were sexually abused also um, say that they were given tablets before bed, um, which was the obvious. Since then, I've suffered with um, damage right to my insides so at least once a year twice a year um, sometimes it goes on to a week um, I suffer badly with heavy bleeding from my ass and you know for years I went to the hospital thinking it was hemorrhoids it was something there is none so there'll be a couple of times throughout the year I'll be saying to Natalie or Harry that you know I need to go um, because it's a fucking mess Um, and then they got some records there was some days where um, apparently I was disciplined because I was having um, I refused to get um, uh, take off my school clothes I used to have a showers fully clothed and I was disciplined for that no one used to ask me why so this is all all in the school records right that she's put everything together um, and there was a, yeah there was a lot of things and, and, and then they rang me um, I think it was three months ago or two months ago now saying uh because of everything else and the evidence was, that was put forward, um, the school and the insurance company um, have come up with a settlement uh, for each and every person. But the problem is everybody else has accepted. If I don't choose to accept, all the other kids won't get their money. And it was 52000 or £54,000. Now, I didn't want to accept because I'm thinking I want these fuckers, you know, going behind bars. Um, but along the short of it is, there is, it's in the, it's in the um, civil court, there is no criminal convictions that are going to be put on any of these. But the insurances are going to pay them out. Cover and, up then. Yeah. And we could prolong this, but then there are other kids that are now adults, have families that have never seen that amount of money in their lives. This is life changing for them. Yeah. And now it's fucking waiting on me. Yeah. So I settled. Everybody else got paid. Um, and these fuckers... I've uh, got away with it. Yeah, that, see, that's the hard thing. But you can understand why you agreed as well for the people who's not got a pot of piss in. Some maybe potentially... I know of one of them. One yeah. of them's literally eating himself. Yeah. Alive. He's that fucked up. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's one that... Um, the only one that I've kept in contact with. He's a decent guy. He lives in Australia now. Um, and now that's managed to uh, put a deposit down on a house for him and his, his mm-hmm. missus. So there's a lot of positives that have come out yeah. of it. But it's a bit like... I took my pick here fucked you fucked you fucked you and then the insurance company will pay you later like you're a fucking prostitute that's you just pay there's no justice there at yeah, all there's no, no justice, but something will prevail when the truth always comes out at the end like you was talking about it there it's, it's out there the people have got they might have a bit of money but you've still not got the closure because you're clearly a fighter you're clearly still wanting plus some. I don't know I yeah. only remember the physical stuff thank fuck I don't remember the sexual stuff yeah um, nor do I want to but then there's a question there thinking why don't you know what, you, you just like you say there's no mm-hmm. fucking closure with the doctor I was found out the fucking doctor the school doctor didn't even have so much as a, as a, um, a first aid fucking certificate you know um, and these people you know are now getting to carry on with their lives with their grandchildren their children you know out free 
yeah, could be living next door to kids, could be still working as teachers. Not even on a fucking register. How many people were involved? Um, I know of 22 victims. How many? With me, there was three carers. With the others, there was a lot more because it went over a period of before I started yeah. as well. Um, so I don't know with that. Mm -hmm. um, but with me, there was three, yeah. First of all, for the courage to be speaking out and openly about it, takes balls, man, proud of you. I had a woman on the show called Barbara O'Hare. She is an amazing woman. She was um, took into a hospital called, what was that hospital called? Um, Aston Hall. Aston Hall, these doctors, what happens is they had a checklist for kids, runaways, families who didn't want them, kids with addictions. What happens is when they took them into the mental institute, they signed them off as crazy. So the doctors were drugging them, abusing them, raping them, killing them. And when, when people run away to the police, because they're signed off as crazy, the coppers just used to take them straight fucking back. Mm -hmm. And this is doctors. A couple's been to prison now, a few are dead, but the scary thing is this shit's going on and on and on. But people like yourself who are so openly to speak out about it, this is going to help a lot of other people come forward and speak out. So it takes massive courage, man. And it, and it, and it shows you your character, first of all. It shows you your character, how fucking strong you are. The one thing that did come out of it, the positive thing, is uh, the relationship with my dad. Because... I blame my dad for a lot of things being hard on me growing up. And yeah, he was. He was a fucker when I did start to meet him. But then he was used for the punishment side of things. Um, but then I found out uh, at the end of the court case um, as well that my mum knew about a certain amount of element of, uh, of abuse that was um, going on and was taking me back. And I remember... Fucking hell, I can't remember the amount, but I remember on many occasions of me running away, not trying to uh, trying to do everything I can, kicking and screaming, getting forced to be put in the car to, to be taken back, and nobody fucking believing me. I remember even um, sleeping on the school roof um, when I knew certain carers were, were, were on duty. Um, now, the moment all this come out, my dad watched it on social media before anything, and he rang me. Me and the man got the best relationship. And the first thing he was saying was... You know, he uh, he was sorry, but you can't you can't blame him for stuff because I've gone through the, the family court. You have all your power taken away. Now I take a lot of things from my dad. Um, I'm very much like him, so I know if he knew, he would have been in there. He would have yeah. kicked the door down. He would have run away with me. He would have done something. So you couldn't blame him. And for that, it makes me now want to build. You know. Yeah. Something with him. Fair play, man. And like I say, if you were volatile as a kid, you've got every understanding um, to be like that. But it's difficult because, same as Barbara O'Hare, nobody believed her. They called her a fantasist. Nobody mm. believed her, man. She kept running away and they kept calling her a fantasist and taking her back for more punishment, more pain, more trauma. But mm. you come out the other end of it, brother. And that's the main thing. And well, I was a compulsive liar as well. Yeah. So when you look at it, I didn't know what to fucking believe, what I was lying about. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what was true. And what wasn't, and if there was an element of drugs involved, like the professionals are telling us there are, then, you know, it's fucked up. But yeah. it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's fucked up more how something like that can affect so many people. And now it's affecting somebody like my dad, who went through all of that shit, you know, of trying to fight for me and all of that, who would do the utmost to protect. And then he lost to a system that's designed to protect children. And that system ended up putting that child at risk and uh, letting that child down. You know, why? Why? Because of an angry fucking vindictive mother, because the father just so happens to have a fucking conviction from 10 years ago or 20 years ago that has nothing to do with women or children. This is the fucking thing with the family court system. There are so many kids that are at risk at the minute, um, and it's, it, 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 it's bollocks. I haven't even spoken to my dad. I'm only on the phone since all of that, actually, believe it or not. So when we see each other... Um, that's going to mean, I mean, I'm speaking to you first before I even speaking to him. So he doesn't even know really what I'm thinking or what I'm said. So that's going to be a conversation um, when I do um, have a chat with him. And I think, I think that's going to, that's going to be good for both of us. Actually. I think that's a conversation you definitely need to have that. I don't think that your dad was pushing you away. I think you probably just didn't understand the situation that you go through the coach yourself with your kids and you've right. got a great understanding of it now and how, evil women can be as well when they use their sons and kids as a tool that that can be difficult but you never had that protection 
but I believe your father probably would have been there if he knew. Oh fuck yeah, he would have broke any court order. Yeah. He would have done anything, any mm-hmm. anything that a, a father um, would have done. Uh, a, anybody that knows my dad will know he's not a perfect person, but that's one thing that he would uh, he would have made sure that he would have done. Um, but yeah, I mean, for him to have some sort of guilt over over this now is is it's wrong. You know, he's powerless. You got to mm-hmm. understand that. Um, it's. Yeah, but these evil people though and paedophile rings, these, it doesn't just affect the person being abused, it also affects everyone around them wants to hear the facts because the people think I should have done more, I should have done this, but the kids are getting manipulated, it's so difficult because people don't understand, man, and it's such a hard thing to to have went through, but you did come through it and Fair play, man. Fair play for able to sit here and tell your story and expose some truths that need to be exposed because a lot of people, this happens so many times and people are so oblivious to it. Mm. So people are so caught up in it and they don't think they live in their own wee world. But the amount of times this goes on, the amount of people we've had on to speak out and openly is, is powerful and it's a beautiful thing as well. Sometimes you've got to go to the darkest places to find the light and Sometimes you can be the leader to go, well, wait a minute, I can speak out about it, I can still be successful, I'm not going to let these killers destroy my life. Like the majority of people who will maybe turn to drugs, who will maybe turn to suicide, you've not, you've kicked on and, and utilised it to your advantage. You've still got that fire to try and move on in life because you've got your own kids and you obviously want to protect them as well mm-hmm. because you know what the fuck you've went through. Yeah. How was your mum's mindset? Was she fucked in? Was she an alcoholic or addictions or anything like that? Uh, my mum um, is 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 and always has been a liar, um, and I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt because she was my mum, but but she's just always been a liar. Doesn't care about anybody but herself. Um, no, my grandmother was the one. I mean, the only way out of that situation, because no one would believe me, was um, was for me to get kicked out. So. There was an element of me doing stuff, you know, on purpose to get to get excluded, and I and I managed to achieve that at fourteen. Got got excluded, had nowhere else to go, um, and ended up with my grandmother, and then she took me in. And you trusted her? Yeah. It must have been difficult as well because you'd have had no trust issues. At that point, I was one disrespectful little fucker. I didn't give a shit about anyone. Mm-hmm. I would, um, I was just fucking horrible. And then I remember uh, huh, being. F- 14 years old, being in my grandmother's house, and I had a night, and this hit me more than anything, anything, any fucking beating that I ever got, anything. I remember using my nan's computer, and it was when you had the AOL, it's my nan used to charge me 50p a fucking <laughs> <laughs> half hour or something to use it. Is that where you get your business skills from? Yeah. Oh, she's, she, she's taught us, yeah. She taught me everything. But, I hadn't been living with her long and I was in her bedroom using her computer and she, I was using it over the time period and I back chatted her and said something to her. I can't even remember what it was that I said to her. And then all I heard was this noise. I thought she left the room and I turned around and she was on the floor um, with, uh, just crying, crying her eyes out. She just sat on the floor next to the bed and that, that fucking broke me, that, even today. Because that's the only woman that's ever sort of given me a chance. And after that, she didn't need to say anything to me after that. No one ever did. And um, now I don't even swear in front of her, you know. So, and even after that, she never gave up on me. She still kept me there, so. Kept believing in you? Yeah. I think everybody's kind of got someone like that in their life that they don't want Mm -hmm. to let down, that don't want to go right. Because you could have easily just went on a fucking killing spree, and it was rightly so. And I know you say you can't, you, you can control the way you are, but sometimes you can't when your past is so volatile to understand what triggers people and you have had every right to go and do what you had to do to anybody and I believe that and a lot of people choose addiction or alcohol obviously you went down the violent route but it's totally understandable especially everything you went through because you didn't know anything else no she was with me um, all the way um, I, I went to college got kicked out of college um, still had my nans to go back to once I got kicked out of college, she then, you know, um, told me you need to get a job. Mm-hmm. Um, what so you she's college? always uh, been there. Um, I did I did drama and dance. Did you? Were you going to do acting? Yeah. And mm-hmm. then um, I lasted about two months, three months. Why? Are you fighting? 
Um, yeah, there was uh, some lads that took a dislike to me, and I walked down the corridor, and they they spat at me, and um, and then that every every time they would drive home, they would fucking. My, my grandmother lived down Lincoln Road, which is quite a at that time it was a rough place in, in Peterborough and they would follow and throw um, cans of coke and stuff like that um, and I took a I took a meat cleaver into school into the college one day and of all days I fucking told my dad about these lads as well so my dad of all days went in <laughs> to speak to security on that day right at this school and the headmaster and as he's in the security room They've had a call on the radio. There's some kid swinging a fucking meat cleaver around <laughs> the canteen. So, of course, my dad's gone in there with security and it's fucking me, isn't it? <laughs> and there's all of these lads up against the wall and I'm swinging this fucking mm. meat cleaver around. Um, and he took it off me very, very quickly. Yeah. Whacked me around the fucking head, dragged me out. But that was just to protect yourself. You don't know just because no. it's drama school or whatever. Every, every bit of company you get into, you're always going to have that fear factor that something could potentially happen, whether it's getting bullied, abused, whatever, so you're always going to protect yourself, but that was just protection. I interview the biggest criminals in the world, and what I see with everyone else is, that, is vulnerability. Now, everyone who holds a gun or a knife, what is that? That's the, I believe that's their comfort blanket because there's a link to every criminal or every bad guy I meet. They've either been bullied or abused when they're younger. Holding a knife or a gun is a protection because they're so fucking fragile. They don't want to be hurt no more, so I'll hold a gun or a knife Please leave me alone, I just don't want to hurt anymore. I believe that as a vulnerability. That For me, that's a sign that they need help, they need protection, they need love. And it, every single person has that link, every single person. Now, everybody looks at you, a big, strong guy, successful, but when you actually break it down, you, people get a better understanding of who you are and why the fuck you don't want to fail because of all the shit that you've went through in the past. And that's, that's amazing. I man. can't fail. Yeah. And it comes down to, 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 to one word, humiliation. Mm -hmm. I've been humiliated all my life. You can, you can, you can say, fuck your mum, fuck your sister. You can, fuck, you can say anything to me and, and, and there is nothing that you would be able to do to antagonise me. Um, apart from if I genuinely thought there was a physical threat. But if you humiliated me or um, there is, you know, where people are laughing at you, or there's something smallest, it's like, I will just, uh, what do you mean by that? And I'll make it fucking awkward, you know, or I will lose, just fucking explode. It's it's humiliation. I can't fail because there's too many people that would that would that would laugh at me if um, if I did. Um, all my life I've been humiliated. I can't can't do that now. Yeah. From ages of sixteen, then after college, after trying to get a job, what was your life like then? Um, okay, so my dad um, owned a security company at the time. And he knew um, some nightclub owners, um, and he got me a job glass collecting at a nightclub. So I started doing that at the age of 15, um, break for the border and cafe insane in um, in Peterborough. Um, then there was an element of trouble there. I was fighting, um, and then um, I ended up working in the cloakroom. Um, because they had to give me some sort of job out the fucking way because um, it was just confrontations. Did everywhere. anybody know your past at that point, though? No, no they knew my what? dad and they respected my dad mm -hmm. um, and they didn't want to fall out of my dad. So instead yeah. of sacking me, it was, right, let's just put him in a fucking cupboard yeah, out, the um, out the way. Um, I think there was, I think I lasted glass collecting for a couple of weeks, three weeks, and I was glass collecting. There were some pissed up lads and I think I took one of his, he had a bit left. And I said, sorry, I'm always polite. I've always been polite. And he said something. And um, I think when, when um, they, they had a, a conversation with my dad, my dad was like, oh, what were they doing? Were they fighting? And Aaron was in the way. And no, Aaron threw the first punch. And then it just fucking escalated. So he stuck me in the cloakroom out of the way. And then I went from there in the kitchen, started doing extra work, pot washing. Um, and then I met one of the doormen and become friends with him. Um, and he took me to the gym. So I started training with a doorman. And I was only 15 years old. So... Um, I started bodybuilding and then at the age of 17 I had a bit of size and then I started the door so I was working on doors um, that I weren't even old enough to be in. Mm -hmm. um, you taking gear or anything then? Not then, no. I didn't take gear until I was um, 18. I took one five milligram D-bowl tablet and panicked for about 20 minutes afterwards thinking I was going to have a heart attack. Yeah. Um, no, no, not until then. But then that's when I decided to, to compete. So, yeah. How was that for your mindset for like, having panic attacks, breathing difficulties? to then become tr 
to train and, and build your body up and become stronger? Did that give you a bit of protection? I think bodybuilding helped me, actually. Yeah. Give you um, more confidence? It helped me um, exercise. A- any, any, any sort of exercise, um, you know, is going to involve your lungs um, and it's going to be good for you. Uh, and I believe um, the drugs to a certain extent as well also help because there's a lot of steroids that are actually, um, like for instance, clenbuterol, which is a very mild one, but that's um, uh, designed for asthmatics and people with breathing difficulties. So there's a lot of things that I'd taken, um, you know, during um, training that actually had a good effect on me, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with with my personal, with, with my health. But it still hasn't left me. I can't run. I can't box. Um, every now and then um, I do some sort of cardio on the back but after a few minutes you know I'm, I'm yeah but it's not fucked fucked like you're just out of breath you mm-hmm. can't um, uh, breathe um, in fact I, I had an accident um, the other week um, in the water um, we were, were away with Jennifer on holiday and I jumped in and I had to be fucking rescued because swimming then all of a sudden uh, my breathing just fucking went so and I couldn't let anybody know luckily somebody had spotted me and they'd fucking mm-hmm. jumped in they'd give me a life jacket and shit man so yeah so the breathing thing is still there then yeah yeah it can be yeah, yeah. yeah. shock to the system just yeah. it can trigger things yeah yeah, do you panic then? Did you panic then? Get out of the water? Yeah, I did then. Yeah, a panic attack. Yeah, I thought mm-hmm. uh, I thought that was it actually, um, but you know, it, it, you could say, well, you know, um, fighting all my life. Well, how's that happened? Well, as you know, a full-on fucking scrap doesn't last that long. Yeah. You're, you're talking fucking seconds. Um, so, but if you're talking um, boxing, MMA, stuff like that, I could never do any of that. I would be never, I, I would, there was no way I would physically be capable of doing it. Bodybuilding, I'll get my sort of cardio from um, doing my fast walking. I might do a little bit on the bag, but then I hit it with drop sets, supersets, you know, and mm-hmm. I keep the tempo up that way and intensity up that way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a different level of training. But yeah, I do believe it's not only helped me with my health, but training has sort of sculpted my life. Yeah. If you think about it in, in that sense. Yeah. It, uh, People think it's easy. It doesn't matter what you're taking or where you're training or how many times you're training. It's still consistency. You're constantly training. Your videos, you're training every day. Genetics and and consistency. And you do a lot of reps as well, don't you? You take all the gear in the world, but if you've got shit genetics, you'll look shit. Yeah. So 18, 19, we know 19 was when you got sent to prison. Yep. In fact, nearly five years for this Harry Potter book. No. No? No. What was that then? Story I had, um, no, I had a... uh, I had a lot of fucking um, uh, problems. I mean, I had um, uh, a lot of charges against me. I had six uh, battery and assaults. I had a few um, with weapons against police. I had, um, I got arrested for an attempted murder. Um, That got dropped down and I got charged with the threats to kill. There was a lot of things um, that I had that what happened with the book was one thing and actually only one charge but as you can imagine the charge that was in the media Mm -hmm. um uh the most um and that was just a blackmail um and a theft so if you add up the other charges yeah hence the reason why i got so that was just um, a clickbait kind of thing then i mean i think so yeah and that was me taking um the blame for something that i actually didn't even do Mm -hmm. what was it like then did you know four and a half was it four and a half you got Yeah, so it got to the point um, where I couldn't now do the doors because I started doing the doors before the council badge, then they brought in the council badge, Mm -hmm. then they brought in the SIA badge. When they brought in the SIA badge, you're talking, I couldn't even earn money um, doing what I'd done now for so long. So I was just a cunt, basically. Um, I was doing stupid things for stupid money. against people that really really didn't deserve it and getting used yeah yeah that's pretty much it you capable of anything that age still early teens just still in your teens to think that I wanted to prove something you wanted to get acceptance for the I always wanted people. to prove something and um, that's all I've ever wanted to do um, and I've always been easily led um, and easily 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 used and when it comes down to it that's exactly what it was I even got to the point where there was a court order that I was actually banned from a fucking Kettering, the town. So I actually m- I moved to Coventry at one point. I used to have to have a police escort that would meet me on the A14 just to come in, uh, just to take me to fucking court. Um, there was 
I, I, there was that that time I had no driving license, no 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 MOT, no fucking insurance. I remember Arm Response did um did what they call a hard stop on the on the dual carriageway. Um, they got me out of the car, um, guns, every, every, all the fucking palaver. And I remember the the policeman said to me, "You got any guns or weapons in the car?" I said, "No." He says, "Well, we've been given this information." He said, "If you've got anything in the car, the cop, the armed copper said to me, "You got anything in the car that you shouldn't have? That you shouldn't have?" have. And I said, "I've got a pot of D bowl in the um in the glove box." And he he looked at me and he went, "Put it behind the tree before the cavalry arrive." So I put it behind the tree. The copper stood there and he said, "I'm only interested in the guns and and, and drugs, mate." And they come, they search my car. They said, "You got um uh, any idea on you or anything like that?" Um, and as I, as they said that, they pulled my wallet out of my pocket. I had my provisional fucking driving license on me. He saw it, put it back in my in my wallet, gave my wallet back to me, and told me to fuck off. So I put all of my stuff back in the boot of my Vauxhall Calibra at the time, surrounded by police, drove off because they were that they wanted me for right. other stuff to wrap the charges up against me. That's how bad my fucking life was at that time. You know, I was literally um, borrowed time, you know, and, and just, yeah, well, yeah, I just wanted to, they just wanted to get me out the fucking mm -hmm. way. It got that bad. that I was, I was uh, being arrested um, sometimes three or four times a week, sometimes every other week um, because people um, would say he did this, he did that, but this was all from the past. So I ended up holding myself on remand. Um, when that book incident happened, with the book incident, um, the 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 guy um, that that I, did, I didn't even fucking know anything about the book at the time. I got a phone call to say that there was a deal going down at some time, um, and I was going to get five grand to sit in there and look after look after this guy. His name was Christopher Brown. So I was like, well, five fucking of course I'll do it. All I had to do was wear a tight t-shirt and look hard. So I did it. He was talking to undercover reporters, which I now know were undercover reporters. Um, they had cameras in the fucking tyres and the suitcases fucking everywhere. And they would produce a book. And I'm just sitting here thinking, what the fuck is this about? Talking about 25 grand, 50 grand. Um, and the guy tried running out with the book. Now, apparently, it was an unreleased fucking copy of the book and bookies were taking bets on who fucking died. So apparently, it was worth a shitload of yeah, money. Yeah, I've yeah. never I've never read a book in my life until <laughs> this fucking point. <laughs> so, I certainly never fucking watched yeah. Harry Potter. So I knew fuck all about it. But what I did have um, was I had tools mm -hmm. and I had a gun and it was a Walter PPK. It was a real gun, but I only had blank um, ammunition so the bullets weren't real. Mm -hmm. um, Chris shouted, you need to get a fucking book back. So I ran out there. I've jumped, I've hit the guy. He's gone down the stairs. I've got the book. Chris had run outside. He had a baton and he'd gone after the guy outside. Um, and for some reason, I went to the fucking kitchen side um, of, of the flat and I looked out. And when you're talking the sun and the mirror, when they go to places, they don't come on their own with a cameraman. They have a security team mm -hmm. around them. So there was these two fucking big cunts coming in with the reporter back into the, into the um, main door. Of course, Chris is on his way down. So I'm thinking, like a twat, I'm still going to get paid. So I need to look after him. Of course I'm not, I'm being used. So I've gone down there, and I'm thinking I've got to make this look good. So that was it. I started fucking screaming, who the fuck do you think you're fucking with? Loading the clip with these fucking blank mm. ammunition. The guys are like, whoa, 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 whoa. I've put the clip in, I've cocked it back, and I've put it to his fucking head. Well, they've frozen, right? They've stopped. So I've now stood there. Chris is there. I've put it to the guy's head. I've now got eye contact with the guy. Mouth I might hear. Don't worry, it's not real. So I've looked at him, <laughs> I've moved the gun away from the head, bang, and I've put it. Now, if you've ever heard a replica fucking mm, bullet, there is no fucking yeah. way. This guy's fucking ear, it hurt him, right? And I've put it to his head and I went, tell him again, I ain't real, Chris. And that was it. Okay, we're going, we're going, we're going. They got in the car. Chris went, and I went back up to the flat. And it couldn't have been no longer than 15 minutes. My fucking heart's going. I'm thinking, what the fuck has gone on? I'm trying to ring the guy that fucking give me the job to be here. He's not answering the fucking phone. I don't know what's going on. That was on the kitchen side that I looked out the window. And I looked on the living room side, which is the main high street called Tresham Street. For some reason, I went to that window and looked out. There was no traffic down there. Yeah, this is fucking weird. And I saw this police Volvo just creep, pull. Open the door. That was it. Dressed in black, fucking balaclavas, fucking guns running and that was when I went fuck so um, yeah there was uh, uh, 
there was a girl um, that lived opposite us at the time, knocked on her door. Um, I had a couple of guns, I gave them to her. I said, they cannot search your house. Um, they won't have a warrant, don't let them in. She looked after them for me. And I went downstairs and that was where, yeah, that was where they fucking... That How was, was your breathing and stuff when you're going through, like holding guns, robberies? Is the adrenaline pumping that much? You get a buzz when you actually breathe better? It might sound crazy, but do you know what I mean? If you like, if you get into the water, get cold water panic attack. But if you are threatening someone, adrenaline doesn't affect. Yeah, no, no, no. Adrenaline doesn't affect so it's uh, at all. It's a physical aspect, so it's mm -hmm. the length of fucking time. Yeah. So therefore, even now, if I was to have a physical fight with you and it lasts longer than fucking expected, and I'm out of breath, well, if I don't knock you up with the first punch or the second punch, which is what I normally rely on, mm -hmm. then what I do is I'll have to fucking hold you and choke you, <laughs> because by that time I'm fucking out of breath. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but muscle this, mass come into play as well. A lot of muscle mass. That, well, that, that's not going to benefit me. No. Any, either because that's going to be but does that tire you quicker well yeah of course yeah. it will do so mm -hmm. that um, adding on to my breathing you know it's uh, <laughs> it's not good but luckily um, I've um, I've been fortunate enough to, to know how to punch know how mm -hmm. to fight know how to um, to to go on the on, on the offensive first and make sure that that's all I need um, I've I've, I've I've been very lucky, but if um, if I if I was ever in a situation, then you know, of course, no, my breathing's not going to be able to yeah. um, cope. But uh, as far as the adrenaline, nah. what was it like getting your five? Because I know you were in the young offenders, but they put you in with the lifers. Why is that? Because I got started up. They stopped that in two thousand and um, two thousand and six, I think but it was just before they stopped it, I got what's called startup. So basically you go into a young offenders institute um, and you, uh, if you hurt somebody or become a danger, they do what's called start you up and they put you in um, a normal adult jail um, and then depending on the category or what wing. So yeah, I hurt somebody pretty bad and, and they start me up. How was that experience? Uh, what? Hurting someone else? Uh, that's, that That's wasn't really an, an experience. It's something um, I've sort of been exposed to all my life. But um, prison, when I first uh, went in, that was a fucking um, that was an experience. But you uh, very quickly get used to it. I mean, <laughs> it's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. What was it like being with the lifers? Um, when I first went to prison, um, I've been twice. Um, the first time was only for a few weeks. It was just for the same thing, but I managed to get bailed for a bit and then um, went back in. When I first went in, I remember uh, I threw up on the fucking prison bus everywhere. Um, just nerves? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because you don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. and then I remember sitting in the holding cell. Uh, this was when, this is the, 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 the second time. So I'd just been given um, four and a half years. Still fucking processing. Um, and I'm in the holding cell with other inmates. Now I've got one who's jumped up and he's fucking pacing up and down. Fucking up and down. And he's looking at me. And I'm like, I know what he's doing. Because of the, 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 the way that I looked, he's now looking at his arms. But he's making it fucking obvious. Now he's jumped down in front of me and he starts doing fucking press ups. He starts doing sit ups. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's fucking lunatic. <laughs> Please don't put me in a fucking cell with this cunt. <laughs> right, that's all I'm thinking in my head. But he wasn't, he wasn't yeah. right. He was just a, a young lad. But um, no, fortunately, um, I was classed as a high profile prisoner. Um, therefore, I wasn't allowed to share a cell, so I was single cell. They made me share a cell once later on when when they tried to decategorise it, but then I evicted the guy mm -hmm. from the cell. So then they recategorised me and as a high yeah. profile. But after um, that incident happened, um, I uh, yeah, they, they, when they said they're moving me and and they're starring me up, um, when I walked into that, uh, it's not wasn't just a prison. Um, it was it was it was a lifeless prison um, on a lifeless wing, and when you walk in there as a nineteen year old or twenty, whatever I was, um, you're you're looking at fucking men. Yeah. And that was when I I remember thinking to myself, oh, fuck, well, <laughs> fuck, are you gonna get out of this one? Um, that seems to be a common thing yeah. in my head when I end up in this mm -hmm. shit. How the mm -hmm. fuck am I gonna get out of this one? 
Uh, but was the lifers more relaxed on the YOs? The yeah. YOs tend to want to make a reputation, make a name for themselves. Why? Why is fucking Just, much yeah. more? F- yeah, ruthless. Fuck in my there. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's fights every every yeah. two minutes, every three minutes, just mm-hmm. scrapping over fucking bollocks. Um, How's your breathing and stuff in a cell, Aaron? <laughs> Do you not get panic attacks in there? Just very no, you've got to remember the breathing and the panic attacks are completely different. Yeah. Right. So the breathing is 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 um that's 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 from birth. Right. Right. The panic attacks is from my mental illness. Right. The panic attacks have got a hell of a lot worse um with my PTSD as well mm-hmm. since I got stabbed. So the when, when I said about my accident uh, the other week, that was a panic attack mm-hmm. with my fucking breathing. That was why I needed <laughs> fucking help. But all my life, um, no, I haven't suffered with panic uh-huh. attacks mm-hmm. all my life. That's only up until um, uh, up until I suppose early adulthood, mm-hmm. right? But before then, it was just um, the breathing disability um, side of things. Um, but no, the cell, no, the cell, the cells are the fucking. Yeah. Cells are cells. What happened when you get out of prison then? What was your life like then? Were you thinking I need to change or was it straight back into crime? Um, prison was a... Uh, prison, prison was a fucking... Um, an eye-opener. But then when I come out of prison, things weren't the same. Why? Because I wasn't the same. Um, the, the stabbing, the head trauma, I suffered that in prison. So when I come out of prison, there was a lot of now things I have to deal with, with myself, with um, uh, my now paranoia, with um, um, lifelong fucking um, uh, disabilities, injuries. Um, there's a lot of things I've now got to take into account as well as try and work out how I'm going to sort of settle back into fucking society again. Um, but again, if it wasn't for, for, for my grandmother... That wouldn't have, that wouldn't Good have, um, no, that wouldn't so have. She's like your angel, she's like your rock. Anytime the shit yeah. hits the fan, anytime any Pretty pain much, and yeah. misery, she's there to put you, pull into pieces. It's it's funny that, because when you, if you're going to do bad shit, I bet it's your gran that popped into your mind, okay, mm. and, and you probably stopped yourself from doing a lot worse, or worse things to, where well, she pops into your mind, you go, fuck that, I'm not going to let her down. If I didn't have my grandmother, there'll be no sh- shadow of a doubt um, in my head that, that I wouldn't be doing life in prison right now for something. Mm-hmm. If I didn't have her as, as um, I suppose, yeah, and it upsets me because it's, it's, it's a fact that we have only what we got because of, because of her bringing us together, um, sorting me out. Even she believes that she hasn't sorted me out, but she, she has. But if, if it wasn't for her, um, then I would have, yeah, I'll, I'd be in prison for life. I can very easily go on that self-destructive mode, mm-hmm. 100%. And there's things, I've had fantasies about it, um, hurting people, destroying people that have hurt me, that have done the mildest fucking things to me or somebody. Um, and there has to be a reason why, um, why I haven't. There's been an element of hope there. And my nan gave me that element of hope. Um, just until the point of, of my first child being born, Aaliyah. And then um, your kids change it, then you've got another bit of hope. Yeah. And then, um, you know, Archie was born, then you've got another bit of hope. So now you've got three things that are now holding you down. Then Kalel was born, now you've got four things. Then you start building something in your life, now you've got shit to lose. Mm-hmm. But if it wasn't for her, yeah. then um, none of all of that mm-hmm. would have Yeah, happened. when you start getting responsibilities, it changes things, doesn't it? Yeah, it changes the, it changes everything. You need to grow up. You clearly had to grow up a lot faster than any other any other kid. And even having your story today, it's given me a better understanding of who you. And you've got a whole lot of respect from me, even more, brother, for what you're doing and how you're speaking. And it's phenomenal. I know you'll be proud, your sister. It's fucking unbelievable. And I'm I didn't realise half of this. If I'm honest, I knew your story. To an and that's ex- not even half of it. Yeah, but I knew your, I knew your story to an extent, but. I never fully understood you, but I knew there was a story there. And you should be proud, man. You should be proud because it takes so much courage and it shows you your character. It shows you your character. So where did you get stabbed? In the head. What, with a blade? Yeah, in with the what jail? they called a shank. Yeah. So they took it out of engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd hurt somebody. Um, 
Well, the original argument started over a sausage. <laughs> and I hit him with a spatula. <laughs> That was the that's original like fucking comedy. That's like a comedy sketch, that. That was, that was original fucking <laughs> argument, if, if I'm honest, which actually happened a week before the actual last conversation, which that's ended a... up being over toast. <laughs> but that's like a fucking comedy sketch. That's... Can't, mate, and people think I write this up. Yeah. So I, was, I wasn't allowed to be um, given a job, per, and plus I used mm -hmm. to refuse to do a lot of work, but there was a lad that I got on with, and I was very, I was purposely fucking rude and arrogant in prison. Mm -hmm. Um, anti, anti authority though and rightly so though yeah there's a mm -hmm. certain way you have to be in prison yeah. you, some people think just keep your head down get on with it mm -hmm. um, you can do that if you look a certain way if you look a bit different you can't do that and you either to, to keep your head down sometimes you've got to be a little bit fucking snappy mm -hmm. and if people and, and that's how I've been all of my life people don't know how to take me and that for me is like a little security yeah. um, of course that's a protection thing. though because every time anybody that's ever come into your life they've fucked you over back in the day so, right, so I don't find backup. awkward situations yeah. awkward I can keep silent I can you know I can, mm -hmm. I can make something awkward um, but there was one lad that I got on with and uh, me and him got given a job on the server and we said, fuck it, we'll, we'll do a laugh. We'll, we'll, we'll have a laugh. Now, I used to sell the porn on the wing and he used to sell the tobacco. We had a fucking, what we were doing is we were selling the, the um, muffins that, that the inmates were getting for free, the desserts, back to the fucking inmates. Um, anyway, we had, I was working on the server. Everybody gets asked in the morning, um, what, uh, <laughs> what you want for dinner? Do you want sausage or do you want a burger, for instance? Right, so you'll click sausage for bur or, or a burger. So the prison officer's standing there with a fucking sheet and he will come up and he will say, right, English, you're down for a burger. So then I'd go to put the burger on. Well, this lad decided he wanted a fucking sausage, right? Now, I, I know how this sounds, but the thing is, what you've got to think of is they've only made a certain amount of sausages yeah. and a certain amount of fucking burgers. Mm. So now, if I give you that fucking sausage... <laughs> Crusher ain't gonna have anything to fucking eat, right? He's and he's gonna fucking don't. blame me. Yeah. So I'm thinking, <laughs> what do I do? Right? I've been put in a fucking situation here. So I looked at him and I said, "Mate, you're down for a burger." I said, "You can't have a burger." And he's looked at me and he's kissed his teeth and he said to me, "Bruv, listen." He said, "I'm having a fucking sausage. Give me a sausage." And I'm like, "You're not having a fucking sausage." Right, my mate's looking at me, he's like, Aaron, just give him the fucking sausage, right? <laughs> now, my mate, he's a pro boxer, but he, he's, you know, one of them ones that don't look violent. He's yeah, so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just don't want a confrontation. Mm -hmm. He's like, Aaron, give him a fucking sausage for fuck's sake. And he's trying to talk to me, but without the guy knowing that he's talking mm -hmm. to me. I'm like, Scott, I ain't giving him a fucking sausage. Fuck him. <laughs> and the guy's looking at me, he's on remand um, for so many fucking shootings. <laughs> I think stealing sausages yeah, fucking, <laughs> he's this fucking big tall mixed race guy right so I've got a fucking a, 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 a bit of a way to fucking jump as well to hit him and uh, but now he's doing that thing where he won't he won't look at me now he's looking at everybody else as he's talking to me shut your mouth man give me a sausage I'll take the fucking sausage and I'm like I'm over here if you're going to talk to me have a conversation with me fucking look at me don't be so fucking rude and you're not having a sausage you're not for a fucking burger I've just told you you're not having a sausage well I had the spatula in my hand so he's kissed his teeth and he's gone to take the fucking sausage. So I fucking slapped his hand with a spatula, didn't I? And it's really hurt him, <laughs> right? Because it's a metal fucking spatula, right? So as I've hit his hand with a fucking <laughs> with a spatula, Scott has just fucking started laughing. The screws have fucking started laughing. Everyone's fucking laughing. He's now fucking like pissed off. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just fucking escalated, didn't it? So I'm now trying to get over the fucking surgery with this fucking spatula. I think I managed to catch him on the head. I think as we were getting, I was getting pulled. Off and I managed to fucking hit him with the spatula. Um, and then he was mouthing, and then that was it. I think it was a week later. They give me. They said, right, do you want to work on the surgery again? I said, all right, fine, I'll work on the surgery. I said, no trouble. I said, I didn't fucking start it last time. He wanted a fucking sausage. He was down for a fucking burger. What do you want me to do? So they put me down there. They had a word with him. Everything was, well, was all right. He, he would look at me. I would look at him and that was it. Same lad came down and uh, he had his tray and he went through everything. And my job now was handing out the bread. All right, so I've got a loaf of bread in my hand. And this is what really escalated everything. <laughs> just, just when you think he couldn't. Um, he's going with his fucking tray and he gets his food and he turns around and now he's in front of me. So I've got two slices of bread in my hand plus the, 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 the fucking bag of bread and he's just looking at me but when he's looking at me literally it's like this I'm looking like this well, he's fucking tall mm -hmm. and it's, it's just awkward he's not saying anything I'm not saying anything there's people waiting they've got some people that want bread so I'm like all I said to him was do you want the fucking bread or not that's all I said to him 
he he kissed his teeth again. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. That, yeah. He then turned around to the officer, Mr. Clayton, I remember his name, looked at him and he went, I'm going to fucking bang Lambert. So Mr. Clayton looked at him and went, go on then. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Right? So he's fucking turned around. As he's turned around, he's turned his back to me. And he's put the fucking tray on the, on the counter. When I'm thinking, like, fucking giving him a chance, am I? So he's turned around and I've just got bang. I've hit him. It was a brilliant one as well. Sparked him. He's gone right round and dropped fucking out of it. So I thought, fuck it. Jump in. So I was it. Fucking started stamping on him. I went a bit fucking ape shit. Sort of create a scene in the fucking wing, you know. What I didn't realise, if me and you go to prison, for assault or theft, we go to prison. Somebody goes to prison for gang-related crime, they all go to prison together, on the same ah, wing together. Mm -hmm. So as I've done that, screws have pressed the alarm, they've come in, they've broke it up, stopped fighting, they've fucking got me, they've fucking got my arms behind my back. All I hear is, fucking what? And I turn around and I see them all up the stairs and I'm like, ah, here we fucking go. So then you've got to put on a fucking front, in you? Okay. Um, and then that was it for a few days. I then found out that um, there was some plans to fucking do me um, with his friend, because we got separated then, um, with one of the guys that he was a co D with. So he wasn't on the wing now. Um, and they were planning to do me an association. So this is what you've got to think. You've got to think, right, well, you, are you going to wait until your adrenaline's down and then they catch you unaware, or do you just fucking start it? Well, the way I see it in prison, if me and you're having an argument over a pool table and you threaten me and say, Lambert, tomorrow morning you're fucked, I'm gonna bang you. I'm gonna attack you there and then. Fuck it, because I'm not waiting until tomorrow morning. I'm gonna give you then time to think what you're gonna attack me with, who you're gonna attack me with. Because they're not just gonna, the likelihood of them just having a one-on-one -on -one bare knuckle mm. in the prison yard, trust me people, yeah. that doesn't fucking happen, you know? So you, you, you obviously wanna be in control of whatever scenario is gonna take place, in my opinion. Okay, so um, that's how I've always dealt with it. So I was told that this lad was um, planning to have me over. So as soon as they unlocked me, I stormed into a cell. There was two other lads in the cell. Uh, he was on the bed and I had him by the scruff of his neck. Um, even when I think about it now, there was other two there. They could have done something, they didn't. And, I, and I'm screaming at him and I'm saying to him, you fucking planning to have me, I've heard this, I've heard that. No, but I ain't got an issue, I ain't got an issue, bruv. That's between you and him, that's between you and him. So I let him go and I called him a fucking pussy and I walked out. As I walked out, I walked up the stairs, all three of them came out, ran up. Um, one of them um, had a, I think it was a, a peg or something off of, um, out of engineering, off of a motorbike mm -hmm. or something. And one of them had made a, a lighter, uh, sorry, a, a knife out of uh, lighters um, that were melted together. You know, so made like a plastic yeah. knife. So they've gone up, run up, um, hit me in the back of the head. As I've gone down, they've gone to fucking stab me in the throat. Yeah. But my head has gone down. So as it's gone down, it's gone straight through and it's snapped inside my jaw. So, but because there was a lot of blood, they thought that they'd actually um, got me. And then when I went down, and the only reason why I know this is because I saw the CCTV after, then all three of them were stamping on my head um, and that was it, I was fucked. The prison officers, there was two prison officers on the wing at the time, a male and a female. The male ran off the wing, pressed the alarm and locked the door. The female stayed on the wing. And um, yeah, she saved my life. She ran over and from what I see, um, jumped on me, bear hugged me. And um, where they were kicking me in the head, they were now kicking her shoulder. They were then kicking her in the head. They were kicking her in her back. They were stamping on her. And uh, if she never had done that, what the doctor said, it would have been Game seconds, over. yeah, dead. Did you yeah. ever speak to that woman? Afterwards, yeah. yeah. We joked um, afterwards because she had to get a new uniform. <laughs> she was covered in, uh, uh, covered in blood, but never spoke to her again. I don't even know her name. So uh, yeah, she. Watch uh, man, reach out. That's she. Yeah, she was incredibly fucking mm -hmm. strong because she didn't have to do what she did. Even though all the misery and torment you've been through, do you feel blessed to still be here? to raise a family, to now support your own family, to now run in successful businesses. Do you see yourself as being lucky still to be here? Look, look, well, what is luck? Luck is what you've been given, right? Yeah. No. Nah, not through everything. I think luck is what you make it. Yeah, make your own luck, I agree. I was totally. put in that situation because mm -hmm. I acted a fucking twat. 
Do you think um, that brought you down a peg or two then? To I was put in a situation in care because of because of my 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 mum and other people in my life allowed me to be put in that fucking situation. I'm in the situation that I'm in now because I fucking choose to be. Mm-hmm. So I've now decided to create my own luck. Now I've decided not to fucking fail. So what is luck? Luck is what you've been given, so no. Yeah. So you create. You believe you can create your own life, you can write your own chapters and create your own future through everything now because yeah. we spoke earlier and you are in control now. Yeah, yeah. in full control. Mm-hmm. So when you get out of prison, you had to go through all that, the stabbings. Well, before that, I had to learn to um, do some... Um, uh, language therapy, learn how to pronounce pronounce words again. Do you forget? Um, yeah, because I suffered um, uh, a part of brain damage, so I, I had to, I lost all thin of my legs for four days, couldn't walk. Um, we didn't know whether that was going to come back again. Uh, my teeth ended up being all um, um, uh, cracked, then you've got your speech, then you've got your words, even sometimes now I say my words back to front, um, stumble, now I wear... Um, I'm not wearing it today, but I wear um, a hearing aid because now I've lost 30% of my hearing in that side. My glasses, this is complete glass. This is see-through. This now, my eyes like a, a, an egg. So there's a lot of things that I had to do. Then you've got the mental health side of things, which is the fucking paranoia. Mm-hmm. So when I come out of prison, um, you start to have a fight. And this is what my counsellor was telling me. I'm not fighting somebody or if I wish it, I'm the first to attack if there's if I genuinely think there's a threat. And the reason why is actually you hit the hit nail on the head at the beginning of the interview is because I feel scared. So I'm now scared that that's going to happen again. Now, um, because that happened, everyone's a threat to me, no matter how big or, or how skinny. So if I think it's going to go one way, then I will be the one to attack first. And then I'll fucking make sure I make an example of it. Um, but you try and explain that in a court or something, it looks like that you're the, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, aggressor. So, you know, and I suffered with PTSD from that. Um, and, and that's a fucking scary thing. Sometimes you sit on the, on, on the stairs just fucking crying. Sometimes you think the closest ones around you are the, are the ones that are trying to fucking hurt you. I was having an element of that yesterday, believe it or not. Um, and it's constant. You're fighting your fucking... Um, self along with everything else that's happening mm-hmm. in your day to day life and the job on the internet which you know mm-hmm. isn't fucking easy so you're having to juggle all mm-hmm. of that plus learn how to deal with with this that's so new people don't even know how to handle it yet not even us we're self taught yeah. um, so there's a lot to fucking um, deal with but when I when, when I left um, how old were you? going right to prison going through all that 23 so even though I only did just under three years in the end because I went in at the end of the year I ended up being in I think for three birthdays so it was about 23 when I came out I think still a young boy still young yeah. to go through all that straight back to my nans is that, is that the angel? straight back to my nans yeah and I stayed with her I think rent free for must have been two weeks then she went into the kitchen come out and she went right I love you but you have to find yourself a job you can, I don't need the money but you need to pay me £30 a week I remember the words £30 a week mm-hmm. and she she tried not to cry because her bottom lip was going she didn't want to say it mm. but she said you need to learn to pay your bills and then she went that's all we're going to say on the matter and she walked into her, into yeah. her room and I was like fucking angry but yeah. because of her I went up the trading yeah. trading estate was that to give you some structure some purpose in life to get up and make some money and I don't know I don't I don't know what it was with my nan I think she just um it's just life I think she just wants to teach you life skills bills yeah. basic little things learn to pay stuff um and not take things um too easily but of course you know I when I come out of prison um I I still did um illegal things to get extra fucking money um I ended up um, doing really well out of it. But then what I was is I was sensible and I invested that money. Um, I never did it for for the for the show and tell stuff. I had some really close friends at the time that are my best friends now. Um, and one of them said, if you're going to do this, fine, but don't spend money on your cars, don't spend money on your appearance, start buying gym equipment, put it in a container, start doing this. And that's what I did. And the moment I got the gym, that was when I knocked it on the head. You always visualised to having a gym? Yeah, I wanted one. What age did you start doing that? I wanted a gym from the age of 14. Yeah. What age did you get one? I said I would have one by the time I was 30. I got one when I was 28. Mm-hmm. 
A lot of attractions are powerful thing. Did you yeah. understand any of that? Back no, I then? believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Mm-hmm. I believe if you want something bad enough, you'll get it and you won't know how you fucking got it, but yeah. you got it. Yeah. Um, there's things that like that that are happening now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, at 28. And then 30 was um, probably the, the worst time of my life. And then from 31 onwards, that was when everything fucking changed. Why are you 30? Why was that the worst time? 30, um, because that was when the depression was at a high. Was that? Yeah, that was when um, that was when um, when I lost my my last son. Um, yeah, and uh, I lost everything. I lost my business. I lost my gym. I lost, well, nearly lost my gym. Nearly lost my gym, but I lost I lost a lot. But I think in life, man, you've got to hit rock bottom. I think that's where you find out who you truly are is when you've got fuck all. When you've got nothing left, that's when you dig deep and find out, okay, I'm ready now. It's not about why me, it's about try me. It's about, I believe that's when you find your answers. Now, life, when life is going great, you're never going to learn. But when the shit hits the fan, I believe this is when you learn and you either decide to be who you're st- destined to be or you, you stay where you are. Do you know what I mean? At least you made the sacrifices and the changes to kick on and better your life. What was the video with the PC dickhead? Because that shot you into social media stardom, that. That was, uh, that was because of Lindsay. So I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. All right. After everything that I've gone through so far now, I'm 28, got my fucking gym. The gym ended up being the best. I'm not exaggerating. The best gym in the whole of Northamptonshire. 29 um, years old, 30. And I meet, um, so I've got two children, Aaliyah and Archie, and uh, me and their mum are fucking best friends. She, she now works for me. After Kirsty, I met uh, another woman called Lindsay. And then um, met her when I opened my gym. Um, and then she got pregnant with my son, Kalel. Okay, so he's, he's one years old. I go to the gym one day, Luke, uh, who's my business partner at the time, a friend of mine, uh, tells me that he doesn't want to be involved in the gym with me anymore. Um, he, his missus had a beer in her bonnet about me being involved in the gym. Basically, what was happening was um, he would open the gym at seven in the morning. I would take over from one till nine, but he wouldn't go home until about five or six. What he was telling his missus was I was turning up late, not once. He was staying on to personal train some of the female clients and doing his thing. So, of course, when all that got caught out, he pushed the blame. So what I did... Um, is I went to the bank to go and get a loan. The bank um, said I gave them all of the details that they needed and I took my best friend with me, James Collier. Um, James, as you know, he's, he's very well educated and he's a very smart man, very um, uh, logical, right? So he's with me. I remember the bank manager, she said to me, um, I've heard this before, she said, you're not a partner on a business. I said, of course I am. I said, it's all my equipment. Uh, she said, no. She said he registered it as a sole trader in 2012. Never registered it as a partnership. Right, what well, about the business bank account? It's not, you, it's not a business bank account. It's an add-on from his personal account. He's just changed the name of it. I said, well, I've got the password to get in it. She went, you might do, but if you went into the branch, they wouldn't know who you were. Right, okay. So basically, for the whole two and a half years, three years that we were together, every um, credit card payment that was getting put into the gym was going straight into his... Um, personal bank account I went up and saw my friend Simon Fan told him what happened and I'm about to lose this gym Simon come out of the gym uh, out of uh, his reception with 25 grand um, in cash that was all he had and he said given this he said I know how much the gym means to you no contract no nothing so I took that money and I met up with Luke in the gym he said but I haven't told you that I'm willing to sell I want the gym and Long and short of it is, I had a conversation with him and I made him realise that it was it was better off taking the money. And he took the money, 25 grand. The next day, I rung the landlord and I said to him, listen, Luke's off the lease. I just want to inform you, can we get a new um, uh, lease, please? And the landlord saying to me, please don't tell me you've given him the money already. Are you aware that you haven't paid the service charge and maintenance charge on the building for the last three years and you owe me 18 grand? So I've just borrowed 25 grand off me, mate. Mm-hmm. Lost it the next day and ended up 18 grand in debt with 90 quid to my name. So I uh, rung him, rung him, I had a disagreement with him. Um, it, it was what it was. I'm now 
trying to work hard to now keep this fucking gym maintained right who was there for me again me nan so there's me nan lending <laughs> me a thousand pound each and every month and i was paying her back that thousand pound within the month just to pay the rent on my house but what happened was um i was getting more and more um in deep in the end um In the end, Harry, my little brother who was working for me at the time, um, was getting quite concerned about me. I started doing videos on training. This is how it started. All of a sudden, um, I started having a bit of a fucking um, following. It went up to something like 60,000 just on training. People were loving it. People were coming down. They were um, paying for PTs. They were driving all the way from Manchester. And I'd be in the fucking cupboard crying. My brother would be like, listen, I don't want to hear your shit. Go and train. Cry in the car afterwards. So that's what I was, I, I was fucking doing. I was trying to get my head around it. So we were, open, we were working from sometimes 6 in the morning till 10 at night. It got to the point... Um, where I was that fucking um, that low, and I, and, and, and I didn't have anything right. So I'm lying now to to Lindsay, telling her everything's going to be all right. I feel I stayed in in the gym one night, and I filled a syringe up with with insulin, and um, I cried that much that I fell asleep with it in my hand, and I woke up the next morning. So I went to. Uh, I tried to go to a doctor, uh, they weren't really taking me seriously. Um, came to, this is, it came to, to uh, Christmas, um, 2014 Christmas, no, 2015 uh, Christmas, and, um, and it was, it was, a, it was a couple of days after, it was the 27th, and I was working at the gym late, and uh, Lindsay had messaged me to say that, uh, <laughs> that my Christmas presents have arrived late. And she, she said, how long are you going to be, baby? So I said, oh, I'm, I'm on my way home. So I drove up, and I got a long drive, and the lights were all on in the house, and I went into the living room, and uh, it was all Christmas presents um, wrapped up, and a dictaphone saying, play me, with a post-it note, play me. You lying, cheating bastard. Luke told me about everything, told me about this woman, told me about that woman. Never cheated on her once. Not once. Wrapped all the, over, wrapped all the Christmas presents, and they're all the presents that I've maxed out this £800 credit card. Mm. But I know. I go upstairs, and um, my son was gone. That was it. That was the last time I, I saw him. So I fucking lost it. And um, I think it was a week later, Harry turned up at the gym, six in the morning. And, a fucking um, a, a bailiff had repossessed the gym so with a dog so you can imagine Harry's ringing me at six in the morning I'd lost it I wasn't seeing fucking nothing I drove down I got out of the car I said you need to move the dog the guy's like security with a dog back away from the door and I'm like I'm pleading with you everything I have is in that building if you if I lose this I have nothing you need to move and he's saying oh, security with a dog I said, if you don't move, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot the dog. And I don't know how I said it, but I said it in a way where he believed me. And then I said, I warned you. And I walked to the boot. I swear to you, James, I had nothing in the boot but a towel. So I rolled the towel up and he moved the dog, <laughs> put it in the back of the fucking, uh, in, the, in the van. As I, as I walked, I noticed his keys. I took his keys. As I noticed his keys, he had a fucking hatchet on the um, uh, dashboard. Right, that's my get out of jail free card. I know the police are on their way. The police have come down. We're gonna have to arrest you for possession of a firearm. I've got no firearm. Check the CCTV, it's my CCTV. It's nothing but a towel. Okay, we're gonna arrest you because uh, you've broken in. The, he's, he's took repossession of the gym for non-payment of rent. It's not non-payment of rent. I've paid my rent. Here's like, my receipts. It's now a civil matter. Um, this is over, um, um, you know, service charge and maintenance charge. And I said, I now want to put in a complaint before you start doing anything. He threatened me with an axe. He's got an axe on his fucking, on his uh, dashboard. <laughs> so he turned around and they looked at him. You're a legal bailiff. Why have you brought a fucking axe? I'm now in fear for my safety. Can we come in and take a statement? No, close the fucking door. Mm -hmm. That was it. My accountant, who's a good friend of mine, he come over to the gym and he said, Aaron, listen, let me have a look at your lease. I'm not a lawyer, but let me have a look at your lease. He said to me, um, 
your car is on finance, your house is rented. Um, he said to me, um, Luke owns his own house, he owns his own car, and his dad was a guarantor on the building. He said, what you need to do is you need to move your gym yesterday. He said, it's your equipment, move it. And he says, they'll go for him. So I was driving. My friend was in the car with me, and I was driving over, um, where is it? Earthling Borough, right? And as my mate's talking to me again, you can imagine everything's just going fucking in my head. And uh, he said, are you going to move the stuff? I had 300 quid that I managed to borrow off me mate. Right? That's all I had in the fucking world, apart from that other 90 quid that was to live on. As I'm driving, I noticed Earthling Borough um, traveller site. I've looked, fucking pulled, straight in, no warning, no nothing. My mate's like, what the fuck are you doing? I've drove straight in. All these travellers have come out. I've got out. First thing they're thinking is there's going to be a confrontation. So some of the wives have come out. The guys have come out. Who are you looking for? Um, and then this one guy come out and I didn't realise that it was his site, but he sort of kept quiet. And I said, um, I, ain't got, I ain't here for any trouble. I said, um, I'm, I'm pretty much in the worst position of my life. And I started fucking crying. And I said, um, I've got to move a lot of stuff and I've got £300 to my name and I need a van and I need some help, but I need to move my gym, otherwise I'm gonna lose that and I'm gonna lose everything. And they did. Helped you. Yeah, within um, probably a couple of hours, I was driving down the dual carriageway on a flatbed with a couple of travellers <laughs> with all of this fucking metal uh -huh. gym equipment hanging uh -huh. off uh, the back uh -huh. of the van. I managed to get a unit, three months rent free, and uh, started the gym. And then uh, that was it. A few months into the gym, the gym was doing good. I'd met Billy. Billy um, became a good friend. And then um, I, I lost the fucking plot completely then because then they wouldn't stop trolling me. Um, and, uh, and then I, I went and um, I, I got a gun and I went to drive to Luke's house. Um, my brother had known where I was going. He tracked me on, tracked my iPhone, blocked the road. And um, a couple of days later, I went to Jamaica. Do you feel as if you were getting like bullied again that bring back a lot of emotions for you were younger people trolling I'll tell you what I couldn't get stuff. over I couldn't get over what he had done to me it took everything from me and I, I've I've never let anybody get away with that level of fucking humiliation towards me in my fucking life never ever ever in my life and never since do you think that's what gave you the fuel then to put into the fire to make you succeed even more that you didn't want to feel that pain anymore you didn't want to no at the time I didn't want to fight anymore Mm -hmm. I did that. I took I took the gun. Harry had um, blocked the road. I got out. Um, after that, I sacked everyone by WhatsApp. I told Billy I didn't want to see him. I told everybody if they come to my house, there'll be a confrontation. Close the fucking gym. And I went to Jamaica. When I went there, I think it was the day before the day I arrived, Harry had said to me, when I was doing my bodybuilding bits to get my money when I didn't have much money. We got busted, but I, I still had some machines. He said, can you still make that fat burner? Cause you made a fat burner, you developed one. I said, I did it, but um, I didn't, I didn't, I never really pursued it. But I said, I've got somebody that can make it for me. So I rung my friend up um, that I'd done business for, for a long time and he, he was looking after my, my machines for me. And I said to him, can you make me these? Um, this is how I want it made. Um, and could, could, would you be able to do it? I can't pay you now, but I need this amount. Um, and he said, but I'll pay you when, when I've sold it. I had 260,000 followers at that point. Um, and he said, yeah, no problem. I did it. And we put them up for sale and we did 17 and a half grand in one hour. That was the moment then everything changed. Changed your life that everything, moment? Everything. Mm -hmm. That was one hour. Then we put them in sale again, another 17 grand. Then again, that was just over one day, yeah. three lots of 17. You're a fucking what cost? So it's gone from yeah. having bailiffs mm -hmm. at the door to one minute, then the next minute. I ended up spending three months in Jamaica. I came back a completely different person mm -hmm. because I didn't go where the tourists went. I went in the hills. When I came back, um, that was when the PC, um, the, where the, there was PC a police picture. thing happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you potentially could have been going to jail for murder, went away, come back, and your life totally transformed? Yeah. Yeah. When I came back, because I started putting the successes 
online. And then I started saying how we were now reinvesting back in, uh, we were going to now do um, pure alphas, uh, you know, testosterone boost. We started doing other things, but then I made a vow that I was going to make stuff myself because I've been in the bodybuilding industry a long time. I know how the companies rip people off. So I started talking about that. Then I started doing seminars and I started doing gym appearances. Then I, I did three tours of Ireland doing gym appearances. Then fucking all of a sudden, everyone's booking me to go to different places. People are paying up to £130 uh, to, have a, to have a fucking PT session with me, which which now I literally wouldn't have the fucking time to do. Um, everything just blew up very quickly. But because it blew up very quickly, then Lindsay and Luke started um, uh, ringing the police and saying Aaron's selling guns, drugs. So now I'm, my head's, I'm my head's strong. I come back, I find out that Billy's been running my gym for me for free. Didn't close my gym when I told him to. So he's been running my gym for me for free. Didn't want a fucking penny for it. So when we started making it, I said, right, do you want a job? Mm -hmm. Now he's been with me ever since. Started training people. We're getting people come travel from, like I say, Manchester, Scotland, Ireland, wherever. Some people even traveling from Canada to have a PT session. What happened? Armed police coming to the gym. Arrest me in front of my clients. Well, I've got a client on a fucking machine, head down. They've got guns pointing at me, guns drawn. Yeah. So what do I do? I get my friend to record it. They release me without charge. They come around my house, accuse me of not having a fucking driving license. Mm -hmm. Okay, record it. Release me without charge. They come into Tesco's in front of my mum, accuse me of possession of a firearm. Possession, where? Okay, put me in the cells for 11 hours. Release me without charge, I'll record it. All that did was backfire on them. Enhance your profile. I never intended it for that. Mm -hmm. Um, what I intended, the reason why I started filming them is because I've been there on so many occasions where a police officer say I pushed him or assault police, you know, and it just fucking escalates. Uh, I didn't want any of that because I hadn't done anything wrong. But fuck yeah, I put it on the internet. Yeah. It's if you want to embarrass that, yeah. me at my place of work, mm. I would embarrass you. It's yeah. as simple as that. You are a work course, you're constantly promoting, but it's funny how, how the authorities have fucked you over when you're younger, but your videos on them enhance your career and end up. You're already in a yeah. good place. You're already making your supplements. How are you so clued up with the supplements? Because you've got one of the biggest supplement companies in Britain. I've got the biggest. The biggest, sorry. <laughs> there you go. The biggest. Yeah, so you've got the biggest it's supplement. It's one of the biggest in the yeah, world. Yeah, you've got one of the biggest supplement companies in the world. How, as a boy, turned into a man, for all the shit you've been through, to then running the biggest supplement company in the world? One of the biggest companies. Soon to be number one in the world then. Fuck it. Because of, um, because of the team that I've got. Yeah. Trust everyone now. The team that I've got right yeah. now, implicitly. Mm -hmm. I trust them with my kids. I trust them with my bank details. I trust them with my life. Everything. See I've got some family that are blood mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in my team. And I've got um, some friends in my team. But in my team, they all mean to me more than any anybody ever could. Mm -hmm. Sorry, from them. How was it when you were getting arrested? And felt, these videos have been viewed tens of millions of times. Because that must have been through your start your transitions, because that's when I started following you, was when the PC dickhead and the police videos, because your, your videos are totally night and day now, from then, four or five years ago, till now, you became a totally different animal, where, do you look back at those videos and kind of cringe, or do you go, well, fuck it, that was no. part of the process, to what you're doing now? I cringe in the fact, because at the time I was embarrassed, I was getting humiliated. Mm -hmm. When the police turn up, to arrest me they don't need to park their fucking at my place of work they don't need to park their car an armed response car uh, the other side of town and then march me through fucking town that isn't how they're taught to do a tactical fucking arrest you know um, they did that on purpose to try and humiliate me to try and ruin my fucking business and you're coming to my to my to my house um, and telling me I don't have a fucking driving license but I'm showing you my counterpart uh, but your systems are down, you can't check, and I can get my my car back the following day with the same fucking forms. You you, you just fucking you, there's no reason for that. That's why I get the camera out. But let me get this, let me make this very clear. I believe when you get a, if you're lucky enough to get a social media platform as strong as yours or as strong as mine, um, in my opinion, you gain a responsibility. Now it's very careful. I have to be very careful not to portray hatred against the police because I don't hate the police for one fucking second. Um, if my daughter went missing tomorrow, my son went missing tomorrow, they'll be the first people that I call. And I've got a lot of fans that are police officers. What I don't like, what I do have a problem with is individuals. Mm -hmm. Individuals that abuse their position, whether they're in a media position or a police position. Um, I don't like that. And, um, and that is what I will... 
I will uh, fight against. It's about, it's not always about who's right and who's wrong. Sometimes it's about what is right. And that is what, um, what I primarily base my videos on. Mm. It's like when I stuck up for, um, not just Muslims in Manchester, but Muslims around the fucking world when the horrific Manchester attacks happened. That video of mine had over 60 million views. I had Muslims around the world fucking saying how refreshing it was that a white guy with tattoos on his fucking face is actually sticking sticking up for us. Of course I don't fucking condone what fucking happened in Manchester. No person in their own fucking mind does. But I don't call that person a fucking Muslim. The guy's a fucking lunatic. Mm -hmm. He's a fucking killer. He's a fucking... There's something not right about him. And somebody said, but if that was your kid that got fucking hurt in there, you wouldn't be sticking up for the Muslims then. If that was my kid that got hurt in there, I wouldn't be able to go at fucking Ali at the corner shop down the road. It's fuck all to do with him. What has he got to do with it? It's about you, you, what you're doing is generalizing others. And I, and I, and I see things and I have, now have a platform. So now people listen to me. You know, kids that fucking don't really have much listen to me. Kids, um, people that are living the life of crime sometimes listen to me. People that do normally have a lot of hatred in them sometimes listen to me. And if you've got a platform, you can make people think before they fucking act. So I use a lot of my social media for that. And I don't want to portray hatred against the police. I've been pulled fucking how many times by the police? <laughs> even recently, mm -hmm. you know? And even one woman from my number plate, bless her, mm -hmm. she pulled me. She didn't get out of the car until the backup arrived. There was loads of police cars. I got out, I smiled. I said, are they for me? She said, yeah, I need to talk to you about your number plate. I said, no problem. I said, it's on the dashboard. And she looked at me and she smiled and she went, I'm surprised you haven't got the camera out yet, Aaron. And I went, why would I do that? I said, you've done nothing to me. Mm -hmm. Just well, when I've been pricks. I'm not going to put somebody yeah. on the internet and potentially nice. ruin their career and life just to get fucking views. Yeah. They've done nothing to me. They've mm -hmm. treated me with respect. If they're going to try and abuse their position, abuse their power against me, then I've got my fucking power. Mm -hmm. And my power in my opinion, is equal to this. I've seen how powerful that is. Do you think they could have planted stuff on you if you never videoed them yeah. at that point? Do you know what I mean? And I'm scared of that now. Yeah, still, even though you're on a good path. I'm telling you now, look at, looking in your face, I'm fucking petrified of that. Mm -hmm. Petrified. Because your life's going so good. Whenever I'm in the UK, I don't drive on my own. I try not to. Mm -hmm. This is this is the this is this is the reason because I'm scared that that's going to happen. I'm scared I'm going to lose everything I got. I'm scared that I'm going to bump into a Luke, and I'm going to I'm going to walk into Nando's. I'm going to walk into somewhere. You've taken my money and my money off me at that point because of you. I've lost my son. I can't just allow you to walk away. So what I do now is I know what I, what I, I know what I will do. So what I do is I don't put myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. I try and stay when I'm in the UK at the gym, at the coffee shop, or I'm around people, or I now have uh, people that, that I pay to look after me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same in the car because I don't trust that they won't pull me over and, and put something in there. You've got to think of what I've earned out of them. Mm -hmm. They've spent a lot of money trying to fuck me. Even up until recently, they've just taken, uh, they tried to sue me by the chief constable of Northamptonshire Police versus Aaron Lambert. Why? And I've had a court case for the last four or five months, which we've just won. So now not only have they lost everything mm -hmm. over the PC dickhead stuff. Still? Five years ago? Yeah. And they started the court case, went about four or five months ago. What could they do you for though? Uh, harassment. Harassment. Uh, I think well, the, uh, the long and short of it is they wanted to get a court order against me, a gagging order, so I'm not allowed to post against the police in the future. Nah, fuck. I said I'm not going to do no, that because that. that's breaching my human rights. Yeah. And in order to get a court order to, in place to do that, you have to pass a law with Parliament and then you have to take me to the High Court. Now, I know this because I researched all that myself. Mm -hmm. And as Natalie's in there as my witness, I was in court, <laughs> Chief Constable versus Aaron Lambert. I had the team of their police behind and three of their fucking legal team and I represented myself and I won. Mm -hmm. Well done. Again, with correspondence, every legal letter I wrote them was what I won. Mm -hmm. I, I researched and I fucking won. Um, but they, they haven't, but I think what, what they were intending to do is once they got that court order imposed on me, then through the police federation, you've then got um, PC Dickhead and the other officers, they could then sue me off the back of that. So um, that was the intention of it, but it, they lost. But yeah, you were not getting done for, you were providing your insurance and, yes. and license, so you weren't even doing anything? No. So that's why then you're still wary of 
if they've got that order in place, then they could have planted something on you. Outside of my team, I don't fucking trust anybody. Yeah, and I don't fucking trust anybody. Anyway. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. But you've got a right to feel that way, brother, because of everything you've went through. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So see, when you started the supplement company and things started booming, how were you feeling when your social media was rising, when it was hitting millions of followers and you became very successful? How, was there a moment where you took a step back and done, do you know what, man? I'm fucking happy. Was there a moment that you appreciated life a bit? Because no, we struggled to do that. I think um, we have this conversation um, regularly and I feel that if I do start doing that, then you sort of take your eye off the ball. Yeah. Uh, we have the conversation, but I don't, I don't think I can... Um, it doesn't seem real. It's weird, doesn't None it? None of it seems yeah, real. Yeah, people keep telling me, you're doing well, you're smashing it, you're killing it. Nothing feels fucking... It's I nothing couldn't changes. even explain yeah. it to you, James, and do it justice. Mm -hmm. What you've seen, which you're telling me is incredible, you're mm -hmm. saying you should be fucking proud of yourself, I'm proud mm -hmm. of what you've achieved. And what you know is fucking, is, is of the, to the scale of it. And this isn't me, uh, it will sound like I'm boasting, but I'm trying to explain. And even as I'm explaining the scale of it, the stuff that you don't know, how fucking big it actually is, I, st I wouldn't be able to um, do it justice. It's fucking mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy, man. But I love that shit. That's what fucking, that's what turns me on. See, when people have came for the depths of fucking hair and make changes and that, I watch your videos and you're on boats, you're driving Lamborghinis. Listen, I know the majority of people are going to fucking... It's all fake, remember? Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> Apparently. Fuck. Listen, but fuck what anybody says. Apparently. And, but see, what happens in life, people are going to look at Yaren and go, fuck him, but you're going to else give the other half inspiration. If he can do it, then I can do it. That's what I want to do. Set a platform. My boy came from fuck all and self-made. I'm creating everything myself and people... Go, do you know what? If you can do it, I can do it. The haters, fuck them, man. That's just the shit in your shoe. What they got to realise is, I only put on, on on the internet of what you want people to see. Mm -hmm. So people will criticise me. You earn all this money, but I don't see you giving any money to fucking charity. That's because I don't do it for views. Yeah, we've done a lot actually um, for for individuals, haven't we? Um, but and really you matter. don't what do you that. Do with your money well, anyway? but you, no, it doesn't. I've got the right to earn my fucking money how I want to fucking earn it and I've got the right to spend it how I want to fucking spend it. But uh, what I, I'm not and I don't need anybody's approval on this is I'm not fucking fake. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I know when I watch these other social media public figures and they're fucking, you know, they, they give it, they're, they're making sure they're recording everything that they're giving to somebody who's disadvantaged mm -hmm. or whatever. There's a reason for that. Of course. Okay, if you get offered to do it, a charity appearance or somewhere... That's what it's there for, mm. okay? Because you're bringing awareness to it. When I'm treating members of the team, fucking course, it's costing me a fortune. I love them to bits and we're fucking getting views out of it. Brilliant. Yeah. But when it comes to a fucking kid or somebody who's less fortunate, yeah. um, and especially things that we were doing over, we were arranging over the COVID period, you know, for um, um, some, of, some, of the, some of the elderly as well, we didn't even fucking announce that once. And when I contacted somebody to, to, and, and gave him a load of money and, and, and told him to distribute certain things, he even said to me, Aaron, which business do you want me to advertise? The vodka, the supplements, this? I said, none. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about business. Because they don't need to yeah. know who it's from, right? How many businesses you got? Fuck, from know. someone who was flat in their ass, 300 pounds left. I see you constantly working, cafe shops, you've got clothing brands. And the mental brand. We've got the mental hamster, yeah. which is the bread and butter, that's the supplements. Okay. We've got mental culture, which is the clothing. We've got mental vodka, which is the vodka. We've got <laughs> mental monkey, which is not just a coffee shop, but it's our mm. actual um, own brand of coffee. Everything that we've done, we've gone straight to the source, straight for the heart, and we actually want to own it. So the vodka, there is no big company that makes ours, um, like White Label, we, we make it ourselves. Mm -hmm. The Mental Monkey Coffee, um, that's our own registered blend. The supplements, we own every single machine that makes every single supplement. Mm -hmm. So, um, so from the, the factory to the warehouse. Yeah. It's all yours? Yeah. It's phenomenal. It's fucking phenomenal. And I know you definitely be proud in your, your gran and fucking, it's unbelievable. You should be proud, man. You should get, sit in a room or get into a toilet for two minutes and go, look yourself in the mirror and go, do you know what? I'm fucking proud. Because sometimes we can work too hard, mate, and forget how far we've come. Sometimes we can concentrate on another finishing line. If you want to get another shop or new supplement, sometimes we don't enjoy the journey. And in life, is about enjoying the journey. And that's what I need to do. We're constantly working. But sometimes I'm, I feel as if I'm missing out on a lot because I'm working so hard. I just don't want it to stop because I know how much 
misery I had in my life for 32, 33 years. I'm in such a good place. Things are going too good, but when I know they're going too good. I know shit's just round the corner, but I can handle things in a better situation now. I don't react through drink or drugs or hide. I handle it like a man, I face on, and just go well, fuck it. But for all your achievements, you should be proud. And I've, this is the first I've met you in person, and I'm proud because people are going to watch and go, fuck me, what a story. And I've interviewed 120 people, I believe this is one of my best, if not the best. Very yeah. powerful, brother. Very powerful. Right from start to finish. I right? want to make it clear before um, before we end, there'll be a lot of people that do inbox and they, and they watch this and they think, fucking hell, success is the key to fucking... Um, uh, helping helping your mental health and the reason why I'm not getting excited when you say about it, you should you should um, you know get excited about it and, and feel proud of it and yeah I do and when I have um, my bonding moments with Natalie or with a team and I have some good days um, especially with my kids it's great but you, you've got to remember that mental health doesn't give a fuck about how much money you got in the bank or what car you drive sometimes um, it can wake you up hi Hi Aaron, it's me. We're spending a day together today. Um, we, I'm going to remind you of everything. Remember your son. Mm -hmm. Remember your mates. Remember yeah. when this happened. Remember when that. And you've got a fucking day of it. And anybody who suffers with mental health knows exactly what I'm fucking talking about. Yeah. And that, uh, it doesn't get any fucking easier. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes, if you think about it, you're more at risk. Because now I have a lot more. What and there's is. people um, that are willing to take advantage. You, you, you said it yourself about mm -hmm. sharks when you become successful. Um, they're just fucking out for every, you think you're working hard to earn um, your, your money and there's somebody working twice as hard to take it from you. Yeah. So now you have to protect yourself mm -hmm. and it's constant fucking paranoia, constant fucking protection, mm -hmm. constant second guessing. Every, then, then you've got the responsibility, everybody re relying on your decision to make things right, to come up with something fucking good as well as dealing with your own fucking issues. So it's... Um, I wouldn't change my position for the world yeah. because I, I get to see it. Yeah, it. my team and me yeah. experience Succeed. stuff that we've never yeah. experienced before mm -hmm. and we get to we get to help a lot of people along the way. There's mm -hmm. no fucking better job, yeah. but make no mistake, it ain't fucking easy. Yeah. But again, it, it doesn't matter. You're fucking doing it. You're, you're the prime example that it can yeah, be done. It. And all the external stuff, I know people going, on, yeah, but it's different if you're staying in a big house and driving a Lamborghini. All that shit is irrelevant because if you're not happy within, everything else means fuck all. It, it means fuck all. I drive about a 300 pound fucking Mazda or a Vectra. As I'm more financially secure than I've ever been. When I, back in the day, I wanted to have the best, the biggest, all the bullshit of the day when I had fuck all. Now I'm actually happy, I'm traveling. I ain't got fuck all, I've got less. I've got fucking less, but don't get me wrong, I'm gonna get a bit of luxury at the end of the year. So if you want to pass me one of your Lamborghinis, it's, you're more than open, do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think you're being a bit hard on yourself. You know exactly yeah. what you want to do and how you're going to do it and yeah. how you're going to use um, people, me and, and other mm -hmm. people along the way. And when I say use, there's nothing wrong with using people. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with the word manipulation. People use the word manipulation always in a negative way. Yeah. I've manipulated the fuck out of you. You're going to manipulate the fuck out of me. <laughs> yeah. But there's a difference between doing it for a mutual benefit mm -hmm. and then doing it for a selfish benefit. Yeah. Um, you haven't paid me to come on here. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked for anything. I know exactly why you fucking want to interview me. Mm -hmm. And you told me on the phone. I, I know you're going to get the views. Yeah. But at the same time, I've also watched some of um, your interviews. And I know that you're going to ask me questions. And I know that um, I don't ever refuse to answer difficult questions. So it's a mutual yeah. fucking benefit. Mm -hmm. um, where it, the problem comes is when people try to manipulate people yeah. for self gain. Yeah. You know? But that's a successful businessman in my eyes, or a businesswoman. You see what you can do coming on here. And I see, I potentially know your story. Yes. I know the following you've got. I know the traffic you're going to bring. Everything I do is for me. I've got a family to support, but there is no bullshit. I've still got an agenda. You've got an agenda. Everybody's got an agenda, but. That's where success comes because you can see success from it and positivity, mm. same as myself. First, before we finish up, your tattoos, Aaron, explain your tattoos. Because you yep. I know everything means something to you. Mm -hmm. Your tribal tattoos. Is that a tribal mm -hmm. tattoo in yep. the face? Like, is it Maui? Maui. Yep. New, like New Zealanders? Is that like the fucking mm -hmm. old blacks, the tongues out? The original one I had on the face uh, meant something. This one sort of does, but not in a... Not in a meaningful way as in me, but the original Maui's were done with dots and the guy, it's the closest you're going to get for the original, isn't it? He did it with the machine. So if you look, it's actually not lines. Uh -huh. It's uh, it's dots. Yeah. But each triangle um, means strength, power. Um, when you look into the uh, original uh, Maui warriors, um, each shape will mean um, something. Yeah. What about future plans? What's your visions? 
my visions. New ideas, new goals, moving away, travelling the world. Um, uh, We're just taking it day by day. I have um, have a five-year plan, which I'm not going to tell you fuck all about. <laughs> but um, that's not part two. As far as uh, <laughs> as far as um, what's my plans now? I mean, we've got things going on with the company, new products that we're bringing out. The company is getting bigger uh, 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 and bigger. Um, we're now expanding it over in Spain as well. Listen, my 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 plan now is um, is. My my team have, have, have helped me get in the position um, that I'm in. Some of my team, um, including Natalie, my sister, now my business partner, um, is now in the same position as me. But my now long-term goal is to get every member of my team in the same position as me um, and give the two children that I do see all the time um, the best life that I can possibly give and only hope in the future that I can maybe um, do something with Khalil. But... That will happen. My plan right now, um, moving forward, each and every day, what fucking inspires me to keep moving forward? Knowing that I'm waking up every morning and because I'm breathing, that's really fucking someone off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Knowing that the people around where I live, in North Ants, they have to see monkey. They have to see mental hamster. They go home, tie, tie, turn on fucking Sky Store. They see the Lambo movie. They go on Amazon Prime. They see the Lambo movie. They've blocked me on all social media platforms. But their mate, Dave, has just shared a video and it's fucking come up. Mm -hmm. That, that is what really fucking inspires me. I'm just relentless. Where does the names come from? Mental hamster, monkey? Um, you? No. No, we had Alpha, Alpha Training, mm -hmm. and the bigger the company got, we realised there was nine companies in England alone called um, Alpha, and one of them was already registered. So you're opening yourself up, especially when you're as controversial as me. Yeah. So we had a day of brainstorming, and Harry actually came up with it, and he said, what about, we were using gorillas and all sorts, he said, what about mental hamster? I said, what the fuck about mental hamster? And he looked at me and he went, you name me another animal that exercises twice a day on a fucking wheel. That's true. <laughs> and then he said to me, would you put your finger in a cage with, with mm -hmm. a mental hamster? I was like, well, no. He went, there you go. And he went, what a piss take. So we turned up a Body Power, the biggest fucking um, exhibition in the UK. Everyone laughed at us, said that it was going to be an epic fail. And we dominated the fucking expo with a hamster. Mm -hmm. And from then on, we wanted a coffee shop. So I was in a furniture shop and I saw this picture of a mental monkey and I just went, fuck it, mental monkey. <laughs> now we've got mental vodka and now we've just brought another mental something, which I can't say now, but um, life's mental, right? Yeah, I think we've proved this over the last six that, months yeah, with what's yeah. fucking going on. Yeah, it's fucking um, nice. Mental is probably the best fucking name I could mm -hmm. probably have used to call a business to describe me in mm -hmm. the journey. Yeah. Listen, brother for coming on and telling your story and like I said 10 minutes ago I believe this is one of the biggest podcasts that I've done with your honesty and your honest I think people are going to see the vulnerability and the sensitive side to you and not just the man who's successful in business you're also a friendly guy very loving and caring towards your family I've also seen your videos where you're taking your friends out and family members and getting them cars and giving back and that's a beautiful thing man that's a position I want to but very soon and I will be very soon that you're an inspiration and when I watch your stuff I go fuck me man fair play okay. and listen I'm still a jealous person I still look at people and go ba fucking bastard I want I still, do you know what I mean I, I'm not going to lie I'm, I still I fucking want that but I ain't going to I did that when I got my when yeah. I got the boat the other week I saw someone <laughs> with a bigger boat I was a prick he's <laughs> <laughs> probably the nicest guy in the world yeah, but he's a prick today he's a prick yeah. for anybody struggling for anybody struggling with mental health for being abused what advice would you give for them Aaron don't fucking give up mm -hmm. What anybody wants you, whether you, whether it's someone from your past, uh, whatever it may be, um, the ultimate goal is to get you to give up. And I ain't giving up. It doesn't matter whether we're fighting and you're and, you, and you're a lot tougher and I'm losing. I'm just going to keep getting up and keep getting up and keep getting up. And that's how I treat life. I can't I can't give up. Mm -hmm. I'm relentless. And that's. Um, <sighs> you're suffering with mental health what you got to understand as dark as it may be right now you have to believe this is the worst it's ever going to be and that is how I now I, I now I use this saying a lot right I always say now as good as it this is the worst it's going to be so you set this level so you saying with your 300 pound car with what you got now the people that you interviewed think about it this right now is the worst it's ever going to be 
because of the people that you've interviewed, you're only going to interview bigger people, more people. So this right now, and you're happy right now, this mm. is the worst it's going to be, James. Mm. So my position right now, I've set this level. This is the worst it's going to be, right? So now it can only fucking get better. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the darkest fucking place, it doesn't matter whether you're in my position, your position, or whether you've just lost both your fucking kids and, and, you're, and you've got a fucking rope in your hand, right now it's the worst it's ever going to be. So what I'm saying, it's only going to get better from it. It can only get better. It's impossible to get any worse. Mm -hmm. So what we've got to think is, right now, whatever your position is, it's the worst it's ever going to be. Yeah, I love it. I always tell people, you slide 100% of your worst days, so you're right, mate, you've got to kick it on. But Aaron, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed your story, brother. Thank you. Look forward to your success even more, and I'll be keeping my close so eye do on I. that. Yeah, thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right, and be sure to like, share, and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.